Welcome to the Ohio Arts Council's Rife Gallery Programming Series for our current show, In Touch, curated by Megan Young. Today, we are thrilled to present the artist, Kate Budd. As a brief reminder, everyone tuning in today is in listen-only mode. Please feel free to utilize that chat function to ask questions, and we'll be sure to get to them at the end of the talk. Also, please keep in mind that because we're presenting from separate locations, there may be some variation of bandwidth. So if one of us freezes up or the sound fluctuates, thanks in advance for bearing with us. All right, thanks everyone. Welcome, Kate. Thank you. Um, good morning. Thank you all for being here. And before I start, I do want to thank Megan Young for her curating in touch and everyone at the Rife Gallery for their hard work organizing and install installing the exhibition. And if you haven't seen it, it's a terrific show. And I also want to thank the Ohio Arts Council for their support of artists in Ohio. We are extremely lucky to have them. My artist friends from other states are extremely jealous when I tell them what the OAC does for the arts here. So I was born in Nairobi, Kenya. My dad was an aircraft engineer in the Royal Air Force. He and my mom both loved to travel, so he requested postings all over the world. My eldest sister was born in Singapore. After I was born, the family moved back to Scotland and we lived in a tiny village. I had tons of freedom to roam the fields, the woods and beaches by myself. And I climbed trees and I made huts and toys out of the sticks and stones and other things around me. And it was really great training for a sculptor, I think. And then we move closer to Aberdeen, which is in Northeast Scotland. It's a coastal city. I was a complete art nerd. I was drawing and painting in every spare minute. And I had a terrific art teacher in high school who encouraged me to go to art school. And I thought I was gonna do graphic design, but I fell in love with sculpture. And I knew I was a maker. I solve problems with my hands and I get ideas from the material and the process. But I really struggled to find a direction and it was the late 80s, but the program was very modernist. We were expected to use materials like stone, steel, wood, and those things just weren't really working for me. I didn't know what to do with them. I was also deeply intimidated by the shop environment and I avoided it as much as possible. And instead I focused on making things entirely by hand. And one day another student brought some wax in and I fell in love with it. And I was fascinated by how the light affected it, how it felt and the way it transformed other materials and objects when you coated them with it. And my professors weren't as enraptured, <laughs> and I was even told that serious artists didn't use wax as a primary material. And in retrospect, what I was trying to do with it just couldn't work on that larger scale with the materials that I was trying to combine it with. And I was painting it on paper, twigs, and cloth, and it just wasn't working. So I do see the problem. Um, one thing that gave me a lot of hope, I found a book by Lucy Lepard about Eva Hess, and it encouraged me to keep going. And Hess was making powerful work out of ephemeral materials like latex and wasn't concerned that the pieces would disintegrate over time. As long as they expressed her ideas, that was the important thing. And she embraced working with the hands, revealing the process of making, and I appreciated that she questioned the hierarchies between craft and fine art that were just so embedded and prevalent then, certainly in the program I was in. And around the same time, I also saw an exhibition by Joseph Boyce, and it was just basically vitrines that were filled with nothing but tiny cardboard boxes with fat pushed into the corners. And you could see his fingerprints in there like they were amazing and it thrilled me it was a real i didn't know that that could be art moment and his use of materials for their symbolic properties like copper for conductivity fat for sustenance that was a huge influence for me i also spent a lot of time in museums looking at ancient artifacts and these are pictish stone spheres nobody knows what these were for as the picts didn't leave a written history none of the, the theories fit all of the facts about them and museum didactics would say use unknown possibly ritual 
which covers just about every eventuality and leaves things wide open. And it certainly opened up my imagination to run wild. And I came up with the idea that just like the Bronze Age and Iron Age, there might have been an age of wax. And so I used found objects, cloth, and wax to make the artifacts those people might have used. And there was a lot of experimentation with what I could do with the wax. Those little balls are actually berries that I dipped in wax to seal them, and some air got into them. You can see the mold appearing, you know, in some of them, and some of them are kept quite um, well preserved. And feminist art was a major influence, especially the idea that the personal is the political. And looking at that work empowered me to speak my truth about the experience of being a young woman. And it also made it okay to deal with sexuality as a subject. And at that time, there was a fair amount of squeamishness about sex as a topic for art. But to me, it's such an intrinsic part of being human. I don't see how you can ignore it as a subject. This piece, which is called The Secret Life of Princess X, it's about 12 inches in height, and this was an important one. It began with that piece of rusty wire that you see at the top, and I found it when I was beachcombing, and I instantly thought, fallopian tubes, like you do. And then it was as if my hands put everything together by themselves to make this abstracted vagina-like sack that was suspended in a box with these clamps on it, and it was a lesson for me in trusting my intuition. I was in an emotionally abusive relationship at the time. And I think that feeling of being stuck and trapped comes through loud and clear in the piece. And I got into a show at the local art museum. And when I went to look for it, it took me a while to find it. And eventually I discovered it behind the door to the gallery. Like you really had to go looking for it. And I asked about that and was told it was because of the subject matter. And I was really interested in that response because it's a really abstracted form. It's kind of an anatomical representation of the female. I didn't see what the problem was. And looking around the show, there were plenty of very detailed paintings of nude women by men, but they were completely acceptable, apparently, and they were fully displayed. So that was, that was a bit of an eye opener for me. I also have a deep love of reading. My mom was a librarian and my whole family are readers. My love of narrative and fiction feeds into my sculpture and I really like to tell stories. Writers of fiction have to convincingly adopt the persona of their characters to be convincing and visual artists do that too. I root my work in my own experience, but I use my imagination to explore other viewpoints as well. And this is one of my favorite books of all time. Nabokov's writing is transformative. It's exquisitely beautiful when you consider that um, he wrote this book. He was Russian, but he wrote this book in English. It was his first fully English written book. Um, it's, it's incredible the way he uses language. And he creates a truly loathsome character. But through language and humor and the beauty of the way that he writes, he transforms the subject matter. And you kind of even begin to develop some sympathy for the central character, you know, which is a, a real feat. And I got my undergraduate degree and then long story short, after working retail, being fired, going on the dole, um, continuing to make sculpture in my tiny kitchen, I met some faculty from Southern Illinois University at Carbondale who liked my work and suggested I apply to Carbondale, which I did. And I came to the US and again, I was floundering to find a real direction for my work and moving countries was a complete sea change for me. Artistically, I was all over the place and basically just forcing myself to make anything, something. And these are found objects that are wrapped in plaster and cloth, dipped in beeswax, and then I burned them and I repeated the process. And then one day I decided it was time to go back to the body and I was drawing these abstracted sort of vulva shapes and almost by itself my hand began drawing teeth. And I burst out laughing because I just had this overwhelming sense of recognition and it just felt right. 
And that's when I realized that I still had a lot of anger left over, you know, from the abusive relationship, which I had gotten out of when I came here. And I really just had to get it out. And I was angry at myself, honestly, for how long I stayed in the relationship as much as anything. And it was also three years in the past, which allowed me to get some distance and think more analytically about the pieces. And I researched the vagina dentata myth, and I found Jung's theory that it was the symbol of male fear of female sexuality. There are many different versions of the myth found across the world, and their purpose was very obviously to control female sexuality. And I wanted to reclaim the myth so that it was about exploring female power to kind of flip it. And even trapped and constrained, the vagina dentatas were still menacing. Like some people were really truly disturbed by them, even though they were just little sculptures. And they seemed to have the potential to break out. Um, and that to me was a metaphor for how I was able to get out of the relationship of that I was in. And they were constructed um, still very much like using very hand-based methods of working. And I constructed them out of sheet rubber that was taped together with medical tape. And I then coated them in beeswax and refined the surface with a hot tool. And I used thorns from rose bushes. And there's also a honey locust tree that grows in Southern Illinois that has really ferocious spikes. So I would use those for the teeth. And then this was my MFA degree show and the gallery space was completely covered in beige carpet originally. It was even on the walls. It was horrible. <laughs> and I used rubber to cover it up. There was a state surplus a few hours away that had rolls of rubber that were really cheap. And I wanted to completely change the atmosphere of the room and make the viewer feel as if they were in some kind of strange industrial storage facility or maybe a mad scientist lab. And the mad scientist, it's its a great trope. So by taking on that for a fictional persona, um, it really frees you up to explore other viewpoints and you can become the powerful one in the room. And then after graduate school, I got a job teaching at the University of Texas, which was a fantastic opportunity for you know somebody with a brand new MFA. And I would go to flea markets looking for furniture for my house. And I kept finding these objects that resonated with me. And I had the idea that objects can still hold something of our energy or our essence. And if you tap into them the right way, energy is released. And this one, this is an old fishing tackle box. The amber material drip coming down from it is latex tubing, and those are glass pipettes that are dangling from the bottom. It's about 24 inches tall, it's quite small. This box held embalming fluid, and someone had written yellow flesh on the side of the crate in pencil, which is kind of disturbing, but I'm sure there's a completely rational explanation for it. And this one's a bit bigger, so it's probably about six feet tall, and dipping multiple glass objects in beeswax and lighting them from behind made them glow, suggesting energy release. And I use copper wire to suggest conductivity. And this is a detail of the light bulbs. I sewed them into saran wrap and then dipped them in beeswax. And you can see the wax kind of beating up on the wires there. And it was highly repetitive work. Um, it was kind of a challenge to get through the boredom of that, but it was really what the idea needed. And with repetition, it almost got meditative to make the same motions over and over and over again. This one is a spirit level. Um, as a sculptor, it makes a lot of sense to me that your tools, which really become an extension of your body, um, could carry on your spirit. A bed spring which is again a loaded object that has a really rich history to it. And those egg-like forms, those are actually just light bulbs. They're just really big, different wattages and sizes. And this was my first solo show at Texas Tech in 1996. And one thing I hadn't anticipated was how the pieces would sway as people walked by and they would make this kind of soft clicking noise as the glass pieces bumped against each other. 
then after three years in Texas, I came to the Myers School of Art at the University of Akron. And in 3D design, which is one of the classes I teach, we had a project where students would carve small chunks of alabaster. And from doing that and helping students do it, that's how I got the idea to carve paraffin wax. With this series, I was trying to represent the emotion of desire. And that's a cast iron form that I made when I returned to Carbondale for an iron pour. It's clinging to a bed of magnets and it's got tiny braided ropes of steel wool, which are also magnetic, kind of holding it down. Also the T-pins on there holding the braids down, those are also magnetic. And I thought the magnets were a good way to represent that invisible pull between two people. This gallery had industrial carpeting, which felt really wrong for the work. And I've been thinking about the Selkie myths from Northern Scotland, where seals take on human form and change habitats to go from the sea to the land. And I wanted to suggest the flow of water across a beach. So I covered the floor of the gallery with Luan plywood, and then I poured um, pots of hot wax all over it. And the wax over the Luan was actually quite flesh-like. It was surprisingly durable too. I think people think wax is really fragile, but the wax bonded really well with the, the Luan. And a bunch of us even danced on it after the opening and it was just fun. And the card wax forms represented the female body in these pieces. So they have the appearance of kind of swollen bellies and I was thinking about male-female relationships and how desire can create messy situations and get you into all kinds of trouble. And in this one, there's lead wool in the belly button of the piece, suggesting danger or toxicity. And here, the iron piece is dangling over a pocket filled with salt, which will cause it to rust if it ever manages to connect. And those iron forms, by the way, they were made by casting wax into condoms, which were then cast into iron. And I learned the hard way which brands of condom were most likely to burst when filled with hot wax. So if anybody needs that information, let me know. And this is a close up of the salt in that piece. I was reading different myths about love and relationships for inspiration. Um, this one came out of the myth about Selene, the moon goddess, and she loved Endymion so much that she put him to sleep for eternity so that he would never lose his beauty and he would never grow old. And when you think about that, that's a completely toxic relationship. Here he is sleeping. And I carved a little pocket and lined it with salt. And the variations of color and speckling are caused when you cast wax in large volume. I was pouring the wax one pot at a time in layers, which is what causes the bubbles. Um, but I did love those variations and felt that it made the forms even more like the body with its individuality and its imperfections. And this was a solo exhibition at the Sculpture Center in Cleveland in 2000. And again, there was carpet on the floor and I just can't stand the thought of wax on carpet. So I sewed latex panels on the floor and I lined them with copper and steel BBs underneath so they could show through the latex and they sort of suggested frog spawn or some other organic substance. And with that, with the BBs, I bought something like 15 boxes off them at Walmart um, the guy at the gun department who was helping me was giving me these really funny looks and I wasn't going to explain what I needed them for because I didn't think he was the right audience. And finally he said, you must have one hell of a squirrel problem. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I do. Another artist I'm in awe of is Kiki Smith. She's broken so many taboos of what an appropriate subject for art is, and her reimagination of creation myths with herself as the central figure resonates for me. This next body of work was triggered by the debate over abortion, and a politician at the time was very public with their belief that birth control should be banned, um, that conversation is reappearing now. As I thought about that, and I followed the idea to its logical conclusion, I realized this male politician was really advocating forced birth. 
another way to control women. And I think making the decision to have an abortion is incredibly difficult. I don't know anyone who would make it lightly or frivolously. And I believe that the only person who really should make that decision is the one who will leave, live with the consequences. And I couldn't understand the mentality of believing that you have the right to make that kind of decision for somebody else. So to try and understand that, I tried to put myself in the position of this. So I again adopted the persona of a mad scientist, and this time forcing female forms to reproduce and then nurture their young. And this installation was at the Akron Art Museum, and that was also 2000. I carved scars into the pieces that were reminiscent of cesarean scars to suggest the forcible extraction of the eggs. And there's some salt in that scar to suggest bodily processes. And then I connected the eggs with copper wire to suggest the transfer of energy or sustenance. In case you're wondering where I got all of this wax, it was left over from an installation by another artist at the mattress factory in Pittsburgh. And I was on a field trip with my students and I asked what they were gonna do with the wax at the end of the show. And they said, well, we're just gonna throw it out. So I gave them my card and said, please call me. <laughs> and they called me and I got about 7,000 pounds of wax for free. To make the eggs, I filled balloons with beans. Those are adzuki beans. And then I poured the hot wax in. And then you can just peel the balloon off and that leaves the form. And then at the same time as the Akron Art Museum, like honestly, they opened the same day. It was intense. Um, but I did this installation at Spaces in Cleveland, exploring the same idea, but in a way that activated the whole space of the room a bit more. And I had these belly-like forms mounted to the walls. And then the eggs traveled throughout the whole gallery. And they ended up clipped to these latex panels that were over the windows, which I put there. Um, and those are copper alligator clips holding them on. And it's funny, the latex smelled a lot like white chocolate, which added a whole layer I hadn't thought about. Unfortunately, the latex is very affected by UV light and it deteriorated in the daylight much faster than I had anticipated. The eggs started ripping away from the latex, leaving these perfect round holes. And I felt terrible, but the people at Spaces were really understanding about it. They thought it was part of the piece and they embraced, you know, they, even when I explained it wasn't, they were completely fine with it. They said, well, we are here to help you experiment. I really appreciated that. And then this was the final iteration of that series with a form that's a little more specifically figurative. And it was interesting, even though I knew they weren't real, you know, they're, they're obviously not alive, but it still really disturbed me to make these pieces. It just feels really wrong to treat anything like this. And after that, I decided it was time to make something kind of powerful again. And this piece is called Petal. It's about 22 inches in height. And I had the urge to make a hermaphrodite that would integrate both male and female aspects. So these have female genitalia. And then I added antlers to represent the male. And this is about two foot tall. It's carved from a solid block of wax, which I actually cast into a garbage can to get the size. This one's called Precious. And the names came out of their gestures. Um, they felt like children reaching to be picked up. So there was, there was something childlike about them. I also felt like a challenge. Um, carving antlers out of wax is not easy. And I kept breaking them. But what's great about wax is that you can repair it by welding it back together with a hot tool. And a little bit about the process. These are some of my wax carving tools. I start with a solid block of wax. There's a little bit of hammer and chisel work at the start. And on the big pieces, I use a propane torch to melt layers quickly. So it's sort of like you're melting, then you're scraping. But most of the material is removed by dragging tools that have a tooth edge across the surface. And 
the little tiny skinny steel tools you see, they were hand forged in Italy. I found out that they were all made by one person. He passed away. This is, um, a, the, the family is called Caselli and he passed away and it's now almost impossible to find them. It's really hard to get your hands on them. And I'm really lucky to have found them when I did. They're beautifully balanced. They fit the hand perfectly. People have tried to copy them, but they just aren't the same. They don't feel right in your hand. There's a the tiny one to the left of the brush. That's my most valuable player. So it's what I use for the final surfacing of almost every piece. The teeth are really fine. So you get this kind of cross hatch effect when you change directions with it. Honestly, I'm not sure what my work would be like if I didn't have that tool. And I'll talk more about carving as a process later. So these pieces became more generally about defensiveness and seduction. So things that pull you in, but also keep you away. And I cast wax into plastic garbage cans, like I was saying, and then huge Rubbermaid containers, like whatever had the form I needed to get that basic starting point. The pink color, that's from adding oil paint to the wax when it's molten. And um, when you cast big blocks of wax or even small blocks, you get these shrinkage things happening where it forms these voids. And so then I would use the pink wax to fill the voids. And then when you carve back in, you expose that pink wax. And then kind of a different shift here with these pieces, I was searching for new ways to talk about beauty and the body. This is Toots. She's about 14 inches tall. And I was interested in the tension created by making semi-grotesque, swollen, truncated forms out of such a gorgeous material. And the question for me was what makes a body beautiful? Like how far can you distort it and still have it be desirable? And this is Sweetie. She's a little bit over two feet long. And I kept thinking about how when we love a baby or another human, it doesn't matter what they actually look like. You love them. They're beautiful to you. And if you've ever seen a baby that's bald, except for that one tiny like little tuft of hair, and there's a ribbon on it, that was kind of what I was doing here. Louise Bourgeois is another of my heroes, especially her figurative work. And this piece just, I stood in front of this for about half an hour staring at it. I think she absolutely nails that early stage of falling in love or lost and being completely consumed by the other person. And constraint is one of those things that keeps reappearing as a theme. For me, it's a metaphor for the psychological effects of difficult relationships. And to be completely honest, bulges are just really fun to carve. This exhibition was at the College of Worcester. And the smaller pieces in the series were displayed on oak stands that I designed and my partner at the time made. I wanted them to reference traditional furniture to give the pieces a sense of being on display as ornaments or decorative objects and to speak to the commodification of the female body too. The problem I keep coming back to, um, or maybe it's just, I'm just obsessed with it, but I keep coming back to it. How do you represent desire? And then how do you inspire it in the viewer? And this piece, Smitten, it's really tiny. It's about six inches long. It's coated with graphite powder. And I covered her head in hematite beads to suggest that she's in that state of lust where all you can do is lay around and obsess over your beloved. And then I had a big shift. So it was 2006. I was tenured. I was recently divorced. I was on my way to a month-long artist residency at Gentel in Wyoming. And those little clusters of buildings in the lower right corner, that's Chantel. And I had no idea how stunning the area was until I got there. Um, when you're in the tenure process, you're very aware that you need to make work that has that wow factor. It's got to be ambitious. It's got to get you shows. And I'm incredibly fortunate to have a tenure position at Myers. And it's a fantastic school. I'm really proud of what we do. 
But through the 10 year process, I got myself on a bit of a treadmill. You know, I felt like I was kind of churning the work out and I really felt the need to slow down a bit and step off. And so I gave myself permission to make whatever I wanted on the residency, knowing that nobody was going to see it. And um, what that turned out to be were these little hybrids that combined the body with natural forms like fruits and roots. And I wanted to get smaller again. I think this one's about two and a half inches tall. And I was actually really dubious about this idea, you know, blending the body with fruit. And it felt like a massive cliche. I was sure I'd seen a lot of that before. Um, from other people, but I just, it was what I wanted to do. So I went ahead and ran with it. And the little skirt here, that's actually deer hide that you can soak, then you can shape it. And I put a little drawstring through there. And then when it dries, it keeps the form. It's actually really hard. This is about three inches across. And what that basic hybrid form gave me was a whole new vocabulary of ways to talk about the experience of being human. And it gave me a lot of freedom to explore forms that I hadn't before. And when I lived in Scotland, I was surrounded by beauty and I was continuously struck with awe and wonder by the landscape, you know, on a macro scale and then also on a micro scale. You know, so it's sort of like the overall landscape is stunning. And then you go for a walk and about every five feet, you're tripping over things that look like this. And when I lived there, it was a real struggle to figure out how I could respond to that in my, wor in my work or if I could, you know, it was kind of so overwhelming. And I have no idea what this thing is that's on the tree. It doesn't look quite healthy, <laughs> but it's the kind of thing I'm fascinated by. And I found that being away from Scotland gave me the kind of distance I needed to finally be able to incorporate my memories of the natural forms I grew up with into the work. And it was like I had permission to like really go for forms that I thought were beautiful. Because I, you know, it's like I think Ohio is really pretty. And there are definitely moments of beauty, but it doesn't have that overwhelming presence that the Scottish landscape does. And what I love about carving wax is that I can start with a really vague idea. And I usually do a bunch of rough sketches until I get the beginning of something that I'm excited about making. And then once I start carving and I start removing material, I begin to see other possibilities for the pieces. And so it's really the perfect process to allow intuition to kick in and things just start bubbling up from my subconscious as I go. And to me, that's where the art happens. I'm actually a bit disappointed if I make the piece exactly as I imagined it. And my earlier work, it, I feel like it could get a bit didactic. And this way of working helps to avoid that. And what's also great about wax is that it's really versatile. You can add all of these other objects and materials to it. The specs are these glass holeless beads. And I think it suggests rashes or infection. This exhibition was at the William Busta Gallery in Cleveland. I wanted the displays to suggest tables that we eat at while simultaneously creating a kind of stage for the pieces to relate to each other and have little conversations. And I love when a slice through an organic form like a pepper reveals of its interior and the tension it creates with a more organic form. It also speaks to human impact on the world around us. This one's about two and a half inches long and it's hollow. And hybrids, I think I really enjoy them because they are ambiguous, but they're also these moments of explicitness in there. And the combinations allow for a ton of variety. And working smaller really meant that I could work through ideas quickly while still being meticulous with execution. And that is one of my goals, is I'm really trying to make things be perfect. And I was taking a lot of pleasure in carving forms that had appealed to me without worrying about them having a deep meaning, which in some of them I think comes through anyway. 
and they were getting smaller and smaller. I think min miniature objects are fascinating. Another source of inspiration are Japanese natsuki, which are part of the traditional kimono costume. And I saw this piece at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, and I have never had such a strong urge to steal something in my life. It's an inch and a half tall. You can even see back into his mouth. You can see his tonsils and his back molars. And I believe there's an intimacy to small things. You really have to get up close to them to even see them properly. And people do seem to be drawn to hold them. If they aren't in vitrines, people can't seem to stop themselves from picking them up. And when they're really tiny, I do find that the form has to be precisely executed or they just don't reward that close inspection. And this is one of those pieces that I, I barely pre-planned it. The sketch for this was literally a squiggle. And then I got started with it and it was as if my hands knew exactly what they were doing. And I just had to turn off my brain and let them get on with it. A lot of people think wax is really fragile. You know, as I mentioned before, it is surprisingly strong. This one is two inches across. It's really thin. It's about an eighth of an inch thin, but it still survived being handled as I was carving it, you know, because I've got to hold them and carve them. So they do put up with a fair amount of pressure. Um, with the really thin ones, I actually have to take a lot of breaks so that the wax doesn't soften and warp on me. A bit more about the process. So I start by carving blocks of wax. And I've learned that you don't want to superheat the wax. You actually cool it. Um, you actually heat it quite slowly. And you want to let it cool slowly for the strongest wax. Don't put it in the fridge. It will get really brittle. And then I rough the shapes out. I refine them, add the details. And hook tools are really good for carving out the interiors. And then to make those tiny balls that you see on them, I have a tool like a tiny soldering iron that I melt wax onto the tip. And then when it beads up on the tip, you then take the tool, you touch it to the piece, and it transfers the wax as a tiny ball. And these gray ones, they're actually covered in graphite powder, which just brushes on. And I like it because it really shows off the surface texture, texture, which can be hard to see on the plain wax. And it also gives us more visual weight. It's also a bit mysterious. You can't quite tell if they're metal or what are they. And I'm also drawn towards forms that suggest some kind of function in the way that those ancient objects I used to see as a kid in the museums had. And I do love visiting museums. It's my absolute jam. The next shift occurred when I made a limited edition of objects for Spaces Gallery in Cleveland to use for a fundraiser, and they needed multiples, and I wasn't really interested in doing multiples, but my awesome colleague Sherry Sims, who teaches jewelry and metalsmithing at Myers, convinced me that I could make one object and then cast it multiple times. So I made the basic wax form. You can actually see that down on the right there. And then I made a silicon mold that I cast multiples of the waxes into. And then I gave them all a very slightly different treatment because I wanted people to get a unique object, even though the basic form was a multiple. So when you're casting, you add sprues to the pieces that are just the channels that the metal will pass through. And then you wrap mount them on a rubber base you add a steel tube or flask around it. That's the mold shell. And then you mix up the investment material. It's a really fine plaster. Pour that into the steel tube. Um, take the rubber base off, heat them in a kiln. So the wax runs out and then you're left with a cavity where the wax was. And this is what the centrifuge looks like. On the left, there's steel flask you know, that has the mold making material in it and it's lying on its side. And there's a tiny crucible right next to it with metal in it. 
and it's kind of butted up against the opening in the mold. And the whole thing is on a spring-loaded centrifugal arm. And when the metal is ready to go, you release the spring. It all goes flying around. It's pretty crazy, honestly, forcing the metal into the mold. And this is the pieces fresh out of the mold. They've, they're still on their sprues. And you can see that white stuff. That's the residue of the investment material. And then there's just tons of cleanup. You've got to get the sprues ground off. You have to get the surfaces clean, retexture where the sprues were. And then at the very end, you patina them. And I had learned to cast in grad school. Carbondale is a big casting school, but I never liked the finished results the way that I enjoyed the wax pieces. But there's something about doing it on a really small scale that makes it work for me. And it felt really right for the work. And I realized that I could make objects that were much more convincingly old than the waxes ever could be. So it got me back into, you know, looking at these prehistoric objects. You know, honestly, even though the wax is incredibly long lasting, if the conditions are right, they found 3000 year old remnants of wax objects in Egypt. And these are bronze and iron, iron age artifacts. Their obvious age and the sense of mystery about what they were used for is fascinating to me. And I tried casting into silver. I remember my mom always used to have something really tiny in her purse, like a smooth stone or a conker. Sorry, conkers are kind of like buckeyes. It, it's just a very slight difference. And she never had anything valuable. It was just, she liked the feel of them. You know, if I had that tactile sense to it. And with these being in metal, I love that I could carry them in a pocket or my purse. And they're also really dense and heavy in the metal. There's a really nice weight to them. I do a lot of filing and sanding so they feel good to the touch. And I really like that with the metal, other people can hold them as well. And then they get the same pleasure I do when I'm working on them. And then I began to create a narrative for who might have made these objects. It was about 2016 and I was worried about what was happening politically in our country. And things like truth didn't seem to matter. Um, alternative facts were out there and it felt as though women were really losing ground in terms of equality. And so I asked myself, what might the ideal society look like? And I imagined an ancient matriarchal society based in Northeast Scotland. And I began making the objects that I thought those women would value. And I decided that the women were the spiritual leaders of the group and also the makers. And the sea and the places where land meets water, um, liminal spaces are sacred to them. So a lot of their objects reference funnels and other things to hold water, like spoons, scoops. And some things look really functional, but the details suggest a ceremonial or ritual function. This one's an inch across. Um, I really like carving spirals and they suggest partial shells that you see on the beaches in Northeast Scotland. And then I also get the chance to play around with forms that reference the landscape. There are these ancient mounds that you still see in the northeast of Scotland in the landscape. And I really want to go and do more of these, I think. And then these pieces are still bronze, but I electroplated them with gold. And along with the rest of humanity, I find gold incredibly attractive. I wanted to see if it would increase the desirability of the objects. And you'll see visual references to things that you'll see, especially on the beaches of Northeast Scotland, like seaweed, waves, pods. And I think the woman would have incorporated them into their belief system as physical manifestations of their gods. I have a lot of fun developing the narrative, and I decided that in the wintertime, 
the men would go south to trade for bronze and gold, and the woman would use these little scoops to make a ritual of gathering their tears. So when the men came back, the woman could prove how much they missed them. But they also kind of liked the time to work on their art. Um, when the men were away, the women were vulnerable to attack from neighboring tribes, so they had to be able to quickly take the artifacts with them if they were raided, and being really tiny makes the pieces portable. And I just, I think everybody loves the idea of treasure, right? So I really love making it. And this one's a favorite piece of mine. I named it Quake after the double-handed ceremonial Scottish bowls. And then most recently, I've been having a lot of fun combining the pieces to make these strange little couplings. And many of them were intended to be separate pieces, but then I started trying them out in pairs. And the planned pairings, the ones I was, I was designing from the start to be a pair, they weren't doing much for me. They were a bit expected and predictable. And then one night I was hanging out with my partner and we were drinking wine and we're looking at the newer pieces and I just start playing around with them, fitting different things together, trying different combinations. And then I found these new combinations that just made me burst out laughing. And I always think if an idea makes you laugh, you're onto something. And something about the pairs feel delightful. They just feel surreal. And I keep thinking about Hieronymus Bosch's Garden of Earthly Delights. And with lost wax casting, pieces sometimes get destroyed in the process, so there is a risk there. And that's fine if you're doing multiples, but it's pretty devastating if it's a one-off piece, and that's all I do now. On the other hand, sometimes it creates an opportunity for something unexpected to happen. And when we were casting this one, there was a problem with the centrifuge, like we didn't get the, the, the cradle wasn't sitting properly that the metal was in. And so about a third of the piece didn't even fill. You'll see that flat spot at the top. There was a whole third of a piece left up there. And I was really disappointed, but then I started combining it with older pieces and I got this one, which I wouldn't have dreamed up in a million years if the accident happened. So that was kind of a nice surprise. I do think um, the woman in that tribe, I think they had a wicked sense of humor. <laughs> and I think they had a really down-to-earth attitude about the body. And the pieces are still very much about the dynamics of relationships. Um, there's a theory that Venus figurines, like the Venus of Willendorf, could have served to demonstrate societal roles. It was, a, it was kind of a teaching device. And I think the woman would have used these pairings to teach their daughters about relationships. and sex, or societal roles in general. And my partner is an archeologist, which comes in really handy. And when I get ideas about how these might have been used, I can consult with him. And I would say that creating this background narrative satisfies my urge to create fiction and tell stories. And imagining these women focuses my ideas in a way that I find inspirational. I imagine myself in their lives. And it gives me a way to honor the artifacts I see in museums and the people who made them too. And that's all I have for you. But I would love to take any questions that you might have. That was wonderful. Such an incredible deep dive into what has uh brought you to the work that you make today. Thank you for putting that together. Um, I do have one question um, already. What would you say is your most successful experiment that has turned into a standard practice for you? Wow, <laughs> there are lots of them. I think ultimately the big one has to be just using wax in the first place. You know, because it, it was really just an experiment, you know, and the whole thing, like the whole experience of working with wax through the years, it's the thing that keeps me coming back into the space. I keep finding new things to do with it. Um, it's just really fun. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to say that one. That was the biggest. 
you know, but lots of other ones along the way. So um, the end product of your work has this delightful um, intimacy, which also reflects the the work that you do, how you create it. Um, and, you know, a lot of times folks are encouraged that bigger is better. And in, and in your case, you are proving the opposite. So I would love to hear, um, because you did make large work as well, how you've come through that and how you manage uh, the expectations of that and help especially students mm -hmm. learn to, uh, to divine their path and uh, settle into what, what feels right. Yeah, it's a really great question, you know, and I think art, you know, and sculpture, certainly in general, you, you'll you butt up against these ideas, you know, always of what it should be, you know, and what what's serious, you know, and what's, it's, there's such a hierarchy, you know, in there. And with the small thing, it really was just about following my, my bliss, you know, like, I'd been working big. I felt like I had proof to myself that I could do it. You know, my undergraduate years were a disaster when it come to working big. I mean, I made some very bad big pieces. Um, but then I went on, you know, and I was able to kind of get my get get to grips with it. And I think it was like knowing that you can work big that gave me the permission to work small. You know, again, it was sort of like you proved yourself you know, now just get back to doing what you did. And, you know, as I said, I find small stuff really intriguing, you know, and it, it really is about that sort of, I want to pick that thing up. You know, you can, you can imagine holding it in your, in your hand. Um, and it's, it's just wonderful for my work for so many reasons, but with my students, we talk about this a lot, you know, cause I'll give them projects and they'll say, what size does it need to be? And some materials, definitely dictate a certain size, you know, or our space restrictions in the building. Um, so there's that, but then anybody who was wanting to work really tiny, you know, if it's like when we get into the wood project in the intro class, that's, that's a place where some of them go, I just want to work really tiny and get some experience there. And I'll be like, absolutely. You know, like, so I do think my experience at um, kind of turning those norms and questioning those norms has paid off for my teaching because it means I can be so much more encouraging of students, you know, to really think about what scale does this need to be, you know, because it isn't always going to be six feet tall, you know, and I do, I don't know. I mean, people have been pretty open and generous to them. You know, people generally aren't dismissive, you know, so I think the small pieces are convincing in their own way. Right. Um, You've mentioned along the way the importance of uh, consistent iteration, failure, mm -hmm. um, and moving through. And so I'm curious what advice you would give to other artists who are trying to find their way through, mm -hmm. uh, like you, you mentioned your unique ability to go into a place and set yourself free from a didactic approach that you had felt kind of stuck in. Um, so I'm curious what, what allowed you to identify that as a way forward and how can you like personally and then uh, outside share how to get there? Does that make sense? Kind of, <laughs> I think well, so. I mean, answering yeah. what you feel. <laughs> yeah, I, I think, for me, what happens is that it's I'll I'll make a certain you know series of work for a while as long as I still have questions about it and I'm still curious about it and I still have things to say with it. But then there's always this point where I'm kind of like I'm running out of ideas, I'm running out of steam, I'm sort of reinventing, just kind of remaking things, you know. And that's the point where I start kind of searching around for what's what's next. And so it's a bit of a reaction against what was happening with the other things. And it's funny because I think over the years, you know, the earlier pieces reacted harder against, 
each other, you know, the series were more radically different. And then as time has gone by, the changes have gotten fewer. You know, I'm sort of, it's like I'm focusing in on, though, this is really what I really want to make. And for me, it comes back to, I, I mean, I think some of the earlier work, too, was driven by circumstance, you know, like a, that Vagina Dentata series was totally about being furious with myself for staying in that bad relationship for so long. And also, you know, a feminist thing and also just talking about bigger, you know, I had some anger, you know. And then once you kind of work through that, it's sort of like what's what's left after that. And I'll, I joke with my students sometimes because I really give them permission to go there and explore the dark stuff, you know. And as I listen to their stories, I am so impressed by their courage. I mean, they're inspirational. Like the stuff they've dealt with makes what I, it was a cakewalk compared to what they deal with. And I'm always like, go there, you know, deal with it. If you, you don't have to, but if you feel the urge to, you know, go because it can really empower you to take a bad experience and make something positive out of it. But I'm through that now, you know? And so for me now, it's like, what's left after you deal with that stuff, you know? And for me, it goes right back to my childhood. And I've seen that with other artists too. You know, it's like, what have you always had a passion for? And it's like, when I look at my childhood, I'm like, I'm making exactly the work I should be making. You know, so I'm not sure I'm going to be bouncing around doing too many different things, but we don't know. I mean, who knows what's what's going to happen in the future, so. For sure. I love um, that idea of sustained curiosity. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Yeah. Um, a lot of well, stuff in the world to deal with. <laughs> you know, there's a lot out there. Yeah, absolutely. Th this has been uh, such a wonderful artist talk. Um, I want to thank you again, Kate, for uh, the generosity of your time and, and incredible talent. Um, thank you all for joining us for this artist talk by Kate Budd as a part of our programming for In Touch. A big thank you to the curator, Megan Young, as well as the participating artists and the Ohio Arts Council's board, the Ohio legislature and governor who support the Ohio Arts Council, excuse me, this great space, and of course, Ohio artists. Thanks, everyone, and have a great day.